All right, it is time for the last video of the semester. And we are going to end by talking about the most famous equation in physics, which most people who even can tell you, oh, E equals MC squared, physics, don't know what it means. So we're going to talk about what it means. Well, all right, and you've probably even heard this much before. E equals MC squared. Mass is a form of energy, which is a little weird because we have spent the entire semester and you spent most of your time thinking of mass and energy as different things. And one of the big revolutions in our understanding of physics that came in the early 20th century came with this equation, which really it wasn't just Einstein wrote down E equals MC squared and then all was light, including mass. Rather, um, this represents the understanding and this equation represents something that turns out to be built into special relativity, um, Einstein's theory of relativity, that ma energy or rather that mass needs to be one form of energy. And if mass is not one form of energy, the law of conservation of energy doesn't work anymore. But it turns out the law of conservation of energy still works. It's just that mass is one of the forms. And so this equation tells you if you have a certain amount of mass m, how much energy do you have in that mass? And because mass has units of kilograms, energy has units of joules, it can't just be E equals m. There's got to be some conversion. And it turns out the speed of light, c squared, is that conversion, which actually suggests, and it is true, that the speed of light is something more fundamental to our universe than light. So special relativity is a classical theory in that it doesn't include quantum mechanics, although there is a version of quantum mechanics that fully integrates special relativity, so it, it fits. But in the classical context, light is an electromagnetic wave, and we have talked about that. So but whereas this E equals MC squared applies to everything. And we will talk a little bit about nuclear physics today. Just to, you're going to see sort of the most important basic thing about nuclear physics. But <clears throat> nuclear interactions are not electromagnetic interactions. So why should a speed from electromagnetic interactions go into something much more general? And the answer is we call it the speed of light. A better name for it would be the natural speed of space time. It's sort of the natural speed of our universe. Our universe has a natural speed scale. Anything that is massless, so light, light waves are massless. They carry energy. They carry momentum, but they're massless. Photons, massless. But there are other massless things, too. So because light is the massless thing that we deal with most of the time, that's why we call it the speed of light. But really, it's more fundamental. This constant C the speed of space-time, but what we call the speed of light is more fundamental than electromagnetism. It's universal to all of physics, as best we can tell, at least in our theories that we have today, which seem to be working very well. So C, it's the conversion factor. It's also a speed. It's the speed that light goes at. But it's also a conversion factor that lets you figure out how much energy is there in mass energy. And then I have the number for the speed of light at the bottom. You see, it. you may have heard 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Um, here it is to 9 digits. Um, which is more than you'll ever need. Well, all right, so e equals mc squared. But is is a, a kilogram a lot of energy? And it turns out, oh, yes, it's a whole lot. And so here we have the energy of a 100-mile-an-hour fastball, which I guess there's probably pitchers who throw those nowadays, um, which is a little scary, especially if you're the batter and he's throwing this little rock at you. Makes you want to face more knuckleball pitchers. Even though you can't hit them, at least when they hit you, you don't immediately vaporize. So a baseball has a mass of about 145 grams. If it's going at 100 miles per hour, that works out to be 45 meters per second. The kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, we can just work that out, comes to about 150 joules. This is one way of getting a sense how much a joule is. The other way is to think about calories and food calories. And it turns out in a kilocalorie, which is also sometimes called a capital C calorie, is about 4,000 joules, right? And so then you think, oh, and I'm supposed to eat um, something like 2,500 food calories a day. So multiply 2,500 by 4,000. That's how much you eat a day, which means if you had the way of taking your food energy and converting it into fastballs, um, so you had all these baseballs hanging off of you, and every so often you could just suddenly convert 150 joules worth of that food energy into a fastball and throw it off, and there is a way to do that. Baseball pitchers do it all the time. They take their internal energy and then throw off a fastball and it goes off. This tells you how many fastballs you could launch if you were able to perfectly convert your food energy into throwing ball energy. But it turns out you waste a lot of energy doing things like heating up your core 
Um, you're radiating all the time, but and yet here you stay with an internal temperature of 98.6 Fahrenheit. How do you do that? You're heating yourself up all the time. That takes energy, uses up energy. Your brain uses a whole lot of energy, and if that's not wasted, I don't know what is. Anyway, if you calculate the mass energy, and you've been looking at this number and wondering why I haven't been talking about it, no, I am. The mass energy of a fastball works out to be 1.3 times 10 to the 16th joules, right? So there's a factor of 10 to the 14th more mass energy in a fastball than there is kinetic energy. So why do we even talk about the kinetic energy? You would need 14 significant figures on the number to even notice the kinetic energy. And here's the reason. In our everyday life, we do not appreciably convert mass energy to other types of energy. The mass energy stays mass energy. The other types of energy, you can convert kinetic to potential very easily, toss a ball in the air. The whole time it's, it's going up and reaches its peak and comes back down, it's converting between kinetic and potential energy. We don't generally convert mass energy to other forms of energy. Now, in this lecture, I'll tell you about cases where we do, and we do routinely, and cases where the sun does, and the sun does all the time. But in our everyday life, we don't routinely do that. Most, almost all, right, up to a factor, within a factor of a billion, all of the mass energy stays mass energy and does not convert into anything else. And so that's why we can treat them as separate things, because they don't convert very often. But this does tell you that if somehow you could convert a baseball's mass energy to other forms of energy, its kinetic energy, the 100 mile an hour fastball, would no longer matter. And the resulting explosion would take out the entire baseball park um, and more. So don't do that, given that mass energy mostly stays mass energy. So what? Well, there are places where you can convert between mass and other forms of energy, and that's why so what. <clears throat> the classic example is matter antimatter annihilation. You've heard of antimatter. What is antimatter? It's just another form of matter. Actually, it's just matter. All right. Mat matter is matter plus something else. There's obviously a semantic issue with that. So antimatter are particles. Particles of antimatter are particles that are just as good and just as legitimate of particles of matter. The only reason we call them anti, which sounds all naughty and bad, is because mostly we have matter particles hanging around, not antimatter particles hanging around. I think they should be called uncle matter and antimatter, but that's something else. So there's this thing called a positron. Turns out every particle of matter has a partner particle of antimatter that has the same mass, the opposite charge, and some other weird things. So it has the same mass, the same total angular momentum. Remember, electrons have this root 3 divided by 2 h bar total angular momentum. Positrons, same thing, same mass, same total momentum, opposite charge. So positrons, so called because they have a positive charge, have a plus 1 charge. And, um, and then there's some other quantum number things, lepton number, that you don't know about that are opposite. But it turns out the way it works, if the two of them come together, it is possible for there to be an interaction where the two of them annihilate each other and produce two photons, and they're gamma ray photons because they have to be very high energy photons. Photons have no mass. So you started with mass, and now it's gone. But it didn't go into nothing. It's not like the mass went into nothing. It went into energy. So we converted the mass energy, and we're assuming they're coming together slowly so that their kinetic energy is a small fraction of their mass energy. So the total energy is two times the mass energy of an electron, and you can see the mass energy of an electron is 0.8 times 10 to the minus 13 joules is the mass energy of one electron. So two of them is that. If you produce two photons, then each photon has to have the same energy as the mass energy of an electron, and that turns out to be a really high energy photon, a gamma ray. So that matter, antimatter annihilation can happen. It does happen all the time. Um, there's high energy processes in space where it happens, active galactic nuclei, supernova, and even at the center of the sun, it's happening all the time. And we do it all the time in particle accelerators on Earth. So this is a routine. So you can take matter and antimatter and annihilate it and make pure energy insofar as photons count as pure energy, but whatever. The reverse process is also possible. You can have two photons with zero mass that come together. And in an interaction, the photons go away and two electrons, well, really, an electron and a positron, an electron and an anti-electron come out, right? So this is, I mean, it's sort of like you're used to chemical reactions where an oxygen and two hydrogens come together, and then water comes out, except what is water? It's oxygen plus two hydrogens bonded together. Okay, so this is different. It's not an electron and a positron isn't two gamma rays bonded together. But if, suppose you didn't know 
that a water molecule was made up of oxygen and hydrogen. You had oxygen and two hydrogens, and boom, now you have water. Where did the oxygen and hydrogen go? They're gone. Now we have this particle that we call a water molecule, whatever that is. So same thing, two gamma rays, two gamma photons come together, and there's some sort of interaction, and then boom, what comes out is a positron and an electron. Sometimes people describe this incorrectly as mass coming out of nothing. And that is wrong. There was zero mass. Now there is mass. So yes, there's mass where there wasn't mass, but it didn't come out of nothing. It came out of the energy of the photons and energy, including mass energy, still is conserved. Now on the right, if you didn't know about mass energy, you would say that there's very little energy. They're moving slowly. So there's a little bit of kinetic energy, but very little energy. And on the left, you'd say, oh, there's a lot of energy because there's two gamma rays. But really, the total energy is the same. It's just on the right. Most of it is now in the form of mass energy. So you can do these conversions. E equals mc squared is so fundamental that, in fact, particle physicists usually cite the mass of their particles in energy units, right? So here are the electron and the proton, and then you can find the neutron as well. This is all from the particle data group's physical constants page, and you can actually find that linked. It's a PDF file that I've linked on the course homepage. So go to the course homepage, click on the link. You'll get a table that includes this and a bunch of other stuff. Um, physical constants, and you can also find on the particle data group ungodly amounts of information about all particles that are there. Well, but notice here, like electron mass over on the right is what you maybe have heard before, the 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, but the first unit they give us is 0.5 MeV per C squared. So remember, the electron volt, I've told you this before, and I'm telling you again, the electron volt is a unit of energy one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. That's just the conversion factor. A KeV is a kilo electron volt. An MeV is an omega electron volt. And a GeV is a giga electron volt. The electron has half an MeV of mass. But when I say that, really, I mean half an MeV of mass energy. And if you look at the table at the top, notice it says MeV divided by C squared. So yes, if you want to get the mass of the electron, you have to divide by C squared and then convert the units right. right? To get kilograms, you're probably going to want to have started in joules, which means you'll have wanted to convert the MeV to joules. But half an MeV, half a mega electron volt, is the mass energy of an electron. And then if you look at the proton, it's 940 MeV, which is almost a GeV. So the mass of a proton and a neutron, very close, not exactly, off by two percent. But the mass of a neutron is also very close to one GeV. So this is why we use EV, MeV, and GeV, because they're sort of a more natural energy scale. So EV is a very natural energy scale for chemistry. Most of the stuff that happens in single molecule interactions are numbers or tens of or few electron volts. MeV is a natural energy unit for nuclear physics, and GeV is a natural energy unit for fundamental particle physics. Just because, look here, electron mass, half an MeV. So if you're going to be making and destroying electrons, MeVs are going to be units. It's very much like how we talk about the distance between cities in kilometers and not millimeters. The kilometer is just more convenient. But then when we are measuring the width of a human hair, we don't give it in kilometers. It's just not convenient. So this is just a more convenient energy unit. That's why we use it. Well, let's go back to chemical reactions. If you've taken a chemistry class, you've probably heard of this thing called the conservation of mass, which says that the total mass before and the total mass after the chemical reaction has to be the same. And in fact, that, that you can go more than that because in chemistry, you don't transmute elements, right? So all you could do is rearrange the elements. So if you look on the left of this, I have methane burning. So what is methane burning? It's methane, CH4, combining with oxygen to make carbon dioxide water. So I have one carbon, four hydrogens, and four oxygens on the left, because there's two O2s. And then on the right, I have four oxygens, one in the CO2 and two in the water, four hydrogens in the um, two water molecules, and one carbon. So the numbers of each element are conserved as well. And really, that's all you really need to know. What they call conservation of mass in chemistry comes directly out of that. But if you look at this from a conservation of energy point of view, if you have the CH4 and the two oxygens and they're just sitting there, they're not moving, and then the chemical reaction happens somehow, it'll happen spontaneously, but if you've ever taken chemistry and you've heard about activation energy, you can uh, make it happen uh, much more frequently by 
putting a little energy in to start with, but we won't go there. So you have these two or three molecules sitting there on the left, one methane and two oxygen molecules. The chemical reaction happens. What comes out is one carbon dioxide molecule, two water molecules, and energy. How, what, how do we see this energy? Well, if you're burning methane, which um, we don't, I mean, I guess we burn methane all the time, but mostly, like, I think, um, I don't remember what gas comes out of Bunsen burners, but you've seen Bunsen burners burning. How does it come out? Heat and light, mostly, but there's also, well, the kinetic energy. Heat is the kinetic energy. It's mostly how that energy comes out. So if you think of burning, obviously there's energy coming out because there's hot flames, right? That's the form that you see or that a lot of the energy comes out in. And remember, heat is just motion of molecules, so it's kinetic energy, really. So, so you could look at this and say, wait, where did that energy come from? And the way um, you often talk about it in chemistry is there's chemical potential energy or something like that. Entirely a reasonable way of talking about it. And so then if you can keep track of the chemical potential energy, you can figure out how much energy will come out in reactions like this. But here's another way of looking at this. And that is if you measure the mass of the things on the left and the mass of the things on the right, and then you include that as part of your energy, you will find that the mass of the things on the left has to be less because that is where the mass came from, right? So here I've got, if you look at the, what is the total mass? So there's 80 at, um, atomic mass units in AMU. Remember hydrogen has a mass of one AMU and carbon has a mass of 12 AMU and oxygen has a mass of 16 AMU. So I add them all up, I've got 80 AMU. So the total MC squared that we've got here is about one times 10 to the minus H joules. The amount of energy that comes out in this methane reaction is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Where did that energy come from? Well, chemical potential energy um, is a way of talking about it, right? There's energy in bonds. But if you had an extremely, extremely precise way of measuring the mass of these things, you would discover that the total mass of one methane and two oxygens is a little bit bigger than the total mass of one carbon dioxide and two water molecules, right? So that total mass is about 1.3 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. If you could measure it to 10 significant figures, that's a tall order to measure the mass of something that light to 10 significant figures. But if you could, you would discover that the mass of the thing on the top, the methane and two oxygens, is greater than the mass. So the conservation of mass actually is not right. But the difference is less than one part in a billion. And how would you know that? Go back to the previous slide. Notice the mass energy of the chemical reactants is 10 to the minus 8. The amount of energy that comes out is 10 to the minus 18, which is a factor of 10 to the 10 smaller, which means the difference in mass is going to be about 10 to the minus 10th um, as a fraction of the mass that started, right? So the difference in mass is 10 to the minus 18 joules. The mass is mass energy effectively is 10 to the minus 8 joules. So the, the difference is a factor of 1 um, 10 billionth in this case, right? The difference in mass is, by a, is off by a factor of a billion, or but really closer to a factor of um, 1 10 billionth. It's 1 10 billionth of the mass is the difference, which means you can talk about the conservation of mass and you are right to like nine significant figures, which is you know good enough for all practical purposes. So the conservation of mass is not strictly right. It's just an excellent approximation, but it really is true. If you were able to measure the what we call rest mass, also in, in uh, special relativity for reasons that we won't go into, but we'll just call it the mass, you manage to get a methane and two oxygen sitting still. And you know from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that's strictly speaking impossible, but we can do close enough that it's good to the number of sig figs that we can see what's going on here. You get them sitting still and measure the mass, and then measure the mass of a carbon dioxide in two waters, yes, the carbon dioxide in two waters has a little bit less mass. But again, it's one part in a billion. So talking about it as mass energy is really inconvenient, and that's why really we talk about it as chemical potential energy and don't try to mix the mass in, because if I want to know how tall you are, I could measure the distance of your head from the center of the Earth and measure the distance of your feet from the center of the Earth and subtract the two to get your height. And that would be inconvenient because I would have to know um, something like, uh, let's see if I do it right, six or seven significant figures because the radius of the Earth, if I remember correctly, is something like 6,000 kilometers. And then your height is like um, 
approximately 10 to the minus 3 kilometers. You would need six significant figures to measure the distance from the center of the Earth to your head and the center of your Earth or of the Earth to your feet to see your height. So we don't do that. We measure it relative to the surface of the Earth. Well, it's the same thing, chemical potential energy. We, rel we measure their energies relative to sort of the offset of mass that's always there. But just as your head really is farther from the center of the Earth than your feet, and if you calculated the gravity, the gravity at your head is weaker than the gravity at your feet by a tiny fraction, but real, the mass is a little bit less on the right. Well, there are places where the mass energy matters a little more. Nuclear fusion is one of them. This effectively is the reaction that happens at the center of the sun. It doesn't happen in one step like this, and there's all kinds of complicated stuff, but we won't go into it. Ultimately, what starts is you have four, I'll call them atoms to start with, four hydrogen atoms. They come together and fuse, so you are transmuting elements here. You don't conserve hydrogen atoms. The hydrogen atoms, really it's four protons, convert, come together to a helium atom. A helium atom has two protons and two neutrons. So two of the protons turned into neutrons. In so doing, to conserve the electric charge, because a neutron has no charge, you produce two positrons. You also produce two of these things we call neutrinos, and energy comes out. This is how the sun produces its energy. Why does the sun shine? Because of this. It's an ongoing nuclear explosion in space. Really, though, um, it's so hot at the center of the sun that the electrons are not stuck onto the atoms at all. They're all flying free everywhere. So really, the interaction is for protons, a proton being a hydrogen nucleus. It goes to what we call an alpha particle. What's an alpha particle? It's a helium nucleus. Two protons, two neutrons stuck together, plus two positrons, plus two neutrinos, plus energy. And then all the electrons that used to be on the protons to make hydrogen atoms, but aren't because it's so hot at the center of the sun, they're all floating around. So very quickly, two of those electrons will find the two positrons, annihilate those, and produce even more energy. But that's later. We'll start with just this one reaction. And you could work out how much mass there is. I've given you the mass of the proton. Um, to like six significant figures and the mass of the alpha particle and the mass of the electron and neutrinos are not massless, but their mass is so amazingly light that we can treat them as massless. It's close enough to six significant figures. You know where this is going. You know that because there's energy released on the right, four protons has more mass than an alpha particle plus two electrons plus two neutrinos. Although again, neutrinos, their mass is so small, we could ignore it. So where did the energy come from? It comes from the mass difference, but we then can also call it nuclear binding energy. But I'll get to that on the next slide. If you actually add these numbers up, right? let's go ahead and add these numbers up. Right? So on the left, we have 1.00728. Multiply that by 4, you get 4.03 AMU. On the right, we have 4.0051. 5, 1, 1 helium, plus 2 electrons, 0. 0.00055, so two of those, and add it, we have 4.003, so about 0. 0.03 AMU of mass was lost, going from four protons to an alpha particle and two positrons and two neutrinos. That's a much bigger fraction, right? That's a little bit less than 1%, so that's much bigger fraction than what happens in chemical reactions. That's why nuclear reactions are so much higher energy and why nuclear bombs um, can get a much bigger explosion than chemical bombs for the same mass of bomb. You can make a really big explosion out of chemical bombs if you want, but you just need a lot of explosive chemicals to do it. The difference here, a little bit less than 1%. So the amount of mass that was converted was a little bit less than 1%. But again, so we talk about, in nuclear energy, we talk about the binding energy. Binding energy is very simple to kinetic chemical potential energy, but nuclear binding energy is a little bit backwards. So what is the definition of binding energy? The, the difference is this, look at this equation, and you look at this and you say, oh my goodness, that's a lot of letters, but let's unpack it. So I have binding energy, and then there's a C squared, so notice there's outer parentheses multiplying a C squared. Okay, so the thing inside the parentheses is going to be a mass. So now let's look at the mass. Well, I have a bunch of stuff minus m. So m is the mass of the nucleus. So if you go back to the previous page, right, for helium, it would be 4.00151. Right? So for two protons, two neutrons stuck together into a helium nucleus, that's the mass right there. And then you convert it to kilograms if you want. Now, if you come back, z is the atomic number. So that's the number of protons in the nucleus. N is the atomic mass. So if you go and you look on a periodic table, the big number is the um, 
atomic number. And then the small number below it is the atomic mass in AMU. So you have the number of protons um, is Z. If you multiply that by the mass of the proton, you have the mass in protons. If you then take N, which is protons plus neutrons, and subtract protons, you have the number of neutrons. So N minus Z, protons plus neutrons minus protons, is the number of neutrons. Multiply that by MN, you have the total mass of neutrons. So ZMP plus N minus Z times MN is the total mass of protons and neutrons if you had them all separated out sitting by themselves. But really, they're coming together into this nucleus. And the fusion reaction we saw on the previous slide tells you when you combine them together, the resultant mass is a little bit less. So M is the mass of the resultant nucleus. That difference times C squared is what we call the binding energy. So if you think about what this means, if I have two protons and new, two neutrons, they have more mass than the helium nucleus. That means if you go from protons plus neutrons to element, you release energy. So a higher binding energy is more energy released. So here's another way of saying it. How much energy can you get out by going from just protons and neutrons by themselves and combining them together to make this nucleus? That's another definition of the binding energy. And then sometimes, so you can compare elements to each other, <clears throat> right? You can, if you combine more and more things together, you'll get more and more energy out, at least up to a point. Um, so if we can compare it to each other, we'll just divide by the number of nucleons. So we can figure out how much binding energy do I get out per nucleon we put in. A nucleon is a proton, or a nu they're both nucleons, protons and neutrons. So this curve here is maybe one of the most famous curves in um, nuclear physics. It's called the binding energy curve. So remember, the binding energy is how much energy do you get out if you go from pure protons and neutrons to the nucleus. So down here on the bottom, H1, what is that? And again, this is we've labeled them as elements, but really this is just talking about the nucleus. We're ignoring the electron, um, which in the mass energy of the electron would matter because it's going to be MeV of the same order, but we're leaving the electrons out of this. Well, a hydrogen nucleus is a single proton all by itself. That's got to have exactly the same energy as a single proton all by itself. So the binding energy of a hydrogen is just zero. And that makes sense. H2, sometimes called deuterium, that is a, an isotope of hydrogen. So we call something an isotope, iso, same, tope, type. Two different elements that are different isotopes of each other are the same element, but they have a different number of neutrons. So there's three isotopes of hydrogen that you'll see in nature. Um, regular hydrogen, which is just a single proton, deuterium. And as far as I know, hydrogen is the only one where you have separate names for the different um, isotopes. So like carbon, you may have heard of carbon 13 or carbon 14. Those are different isotopes of carbon. Regular carbon is carbon 12. So H1, that's hydrogen. H2, that's deuterium. It's just a different isotope of hydrogen. It's got one proton, one neutron. And H3, you see above tritium, is one proton, two neutrons. Okay, so let's look at this curve and think about this. If I want to go from hydrogen to deuterium, well, how do I do that? Actually, I can't do that. I have to have one proton and one neutron. So one proton, one neutron, they're all by themselves, so there's no binding energy there. Deuterium, notice H2, has, it looks like about 1.1 MeV, but this is MeV per nucleon. And H2 has two nucleons in it, so you have to multiply by two. So you get 2.2 H2, two nucleons, 1.1 times 2 is 2.2 MeV. So if I started with one proton and one neutron, and I got them to stick together, I would get 2.2 MeV out. And that's, again, because remember the binding energy is how much energy you get out by building this thing up from protons and neutrons. If, um, if I wanted to go from H1 to H3, well, I have to start with H1, which is just a proton, and I have to have two neutrons sitting around somewhere, and they're all free. And if I can stick them all together to make H3, now I have a tritium nucleus. And if you look at H3 here, it looks like the number is about 2.8 there. Well, if you multiply 2.8 by 3, you get 8.4. And why did I do that? Remember, the vertical axis gives you binding energy per nucleon. So you have to multiply the number by the number of nucleons to get the total binding energy. So the total binding energy of tritium is about 8.4 MeV. So if I can start with one proton and two neutrons and stick them together to make one tritium, I will get out 
8.4 MeV of energy, which can come in the form of um, photons. You can convert it to kinetic energy, whatever. Suppose, however, I started with one deuterium and one neutron, and I stuck them together to make a tritium. And nuclear reactions are more likely to happen this way of building things up rather than three particles all sticking at once. It's going to be a series of two particles sticking. Well, so the deuterium, remember, it looks like about 1.1. And if I multiply it by 2, that's 2.2. So the deuterium all by itself already has 2.2 MeV of binding energy. If I stick another neutron to it, now the tritium, so you, again, look at the number. It's about 2.8, but that's per nucleon. Multiply by 3, you get 8.4. And 8.4 minus 2.2 is 6.2. So the difference in binding energy going from deuterium plus neutron all by itself to tritium is 6.2 MeV. And again, I got that by looking at this plot here, realizing it was per nucleon and multiplying, and then I subtracted off what I started with. So if I can get a, a deuterium molecule and stick another neutron onto it, um, I will get out 6.2 MeV of energy in doing that. Well, so now let's go back to the reaction that was happening at the center of the sun, and that was this thing. Four protons goes to an alpha particle, um, and then also comes out as two electrons plus two neutrinos plus energy. Well, now we're going to look just at the protons plus the alpha particle, and everything else is going to be energy, including the mass energy of the electrons. I'm going to have to, or the positrons. I'm going to have to include that here, produced in this reaction. So come back to the binding energy curve. And notice here, HE4 is... That's what an alpha particle is. It's two protons and two neutrons stuck together. So that one, it's 7.1 MeV per nucleon, but there's four of them. So multiply by four, you get out about 28.4 MeV out. So if I can start with, um, and actually notice in the reaction, I told you I started with four protons because I converted them to neutrons. Let's pretend we've already done that. So then we'd also don't have to worry about the positrons coming out. If I have two protons plus two neutrons, all by themselves, and I stick them together, I will get 28.4 MeV of energy out. Now compare that. Remember, the mass energy of an electron is half an MeV. So the mass energy of an electron is of the same order, or even you know one order of magnitude down, from the kind of energy that's released in nuclear reactions. And that's why you can produce positrons in nuclear reactions, because the mass the energy differences in these reactions is comparable to the mass energy of positrons and electrons. So it's possible to make positrons and electrons to create matter out of energy in nuclear reactions like this. Here's an interesting thing, though, that notice if you go from helium to lithium, so lithium has uh, three protons, so lithium-6 would be three protons and three neutrons. The energy actually goes down there, the binding energy. And remember, that's the amount of energy you get out so suppose I had a helium plus one free proton plus one free neutron, and I wanted to stick them together to make lithium. Well, the binding energy, the amount of energy you get out by building it up from just free protons and neutrons, the binding energy of lithium is less than the binding energy of helium per nucleon. The total binding energy is more, right, if you multiply by the number of nucleons. But the binding energy per nucleon is less. So what that means is, is that, and actually, if you work the numbers out, you can get a little bit of energy out by taking a helium, well, an alpha particle, helium nucleus, one proton and one neutron, and sticking them together to get a lithium-6 nucleus. Uh, because remember, this is per nucleon. So if you multiply, looks like about 5.3 there, multiply that by six for the number of nucleons in lithium, you get 31.8 MeV, which is a little bit more than the binding energy of helium. So this curve, you have to be a little careful looking at this curve. Um, even though the thing the, the thing spikes down there, it's um, you if you have the helium, you can get a little bit of energy out, but only a little bit. And if you look at it, it's going to be better going from helium to carbon because as long as you're going up on this curve, you're getting more energy per nucleon out. So now let's think of going from helium to carbon. To go from helium to carbon, you need to combine together three helium nuclei, right? Because carbon, there's 12 nucleons. Helium has four. Carbon has six protons. Helium has two protons. So three heliums you can combine together to make one proton or one carbon. The binding energy that's released, and here you really can compare these directly, because the three heliums, well, 7.1 per nucleon, so you multiply that by 4, 
but then by three, because you have three heliums, and you're going to compare that to taking the carbon, which looks like about 7.7, .7, and you multiply that by 12. Well, that's the same as multiplying by four and then by three. So if I go from three heliums to one carbon, the binding energy goes up, which means I get energy out. Again, the binding energy is how much energy you get out by going from free protons and neutrons. And so if I go from one to the other, I have to account for the protons and neutrons, right? But um, you can sort of compare. So I can go from helium to carbon and I can get energy out. And if I go from um, carbon plus helium, and again, you'd have to carefully work the numbers out here. Actually, here, no, you can just look at the numbers again because this is per nucleon, right? So uh, now you can't just look at, you have to, you have to multiply the numbers out. To be careful here. So if I go from carbon, which looks like about 7.7, .7, just reading the graph, multiply by 12, that tells us 92.4 MeV is the binding energy of carbon. Helium is 7.1, multiply by 4, that's 28.4. If I add the two, it's 120.8. So if I have one carbon nucleus and one helium nucleus, I have 121 MeV of binding energy. Or if I go to oxygen, and that looks like 7.9 MeV per nucleon, and there's 16, and I multiply it, I get 126 MeV of binding energy. So that means if I have a carbon and a helium, and I can combine it together, um, I will produce an oxygen, and I will get out about five and a half, more or less, MeV of energy. And so that going with, with uh, carbon plus helium and going to oxygen gets out more energy than going from hydrogen to deuterium, right? So it's still a a thing to do, and that happens in the sun. Not in the sun very often, but in really uh, in big stars. Actually, it will happen in the sun eventually. So in giant stars, this kind of thing happens at the core. You will get carbon fusion producing oxygen. Right, and so on and so forth, so on and so forth. But you'll notice that this binding energy per nucleon curve reaches a peak at iron 56. And what does that mean? What that means is, is that per nucleon, Iron 56 is sort of the best you can do in getting energy out. So if I start with a whole bunch of free, so 56 total protons plus neutrons, and I combine them together to make iron, I will get 56 times, and again, if I look at the number here, it looks like it's about 8.7, 8.8 per nucleon worth of energy out. But if I use those together with some others to make a heavier element, I will get less energy per nuclear per nucleon out and there's a lot of things heavier than iron it includes like gold and lead for example and and if you look up at the top of what's plotted on this curve here we've got uranium 235 and uranium 238 uranium 235 is one of the things you can make fission bombs out of atomic bombs what's happening in fission is that you start with something big and you split it apart to make something small and because the of the turnover in this binding energy curve by going from bigger things to smaller things you get energy out so there's a turning point here at iron 56 up to iron 56 except you know there's this dip down at helium and and at lithium and beryllium but going from hydrogen up to iron 56 going from smaller things to bigger things for the most part you get energy out by going from smaller to bigger things but then, once you go from iron on down, it costs energy to go from smaller things to bigger things. So that means, naturally, you expect iron to be the heaviest thing produced, because it would take energy to produce heavier things. So why do we even have elements heavier than iron? They're there, right? There is gold in the world. Go find some. You might be wearing some. I used to have some in my mouth, but eventually I had to get that crown replaced and now it's some ceramic thing and it's kind of sad because that was my nest egg and they took it away from me well it turns out that things that are not energetically favorable can happen it is more favorable for a vase to be sitting on the ground than it is to be sitting up at the top of a bookshelf and yet you can put it on the top of the bookshelf you do that by putting energy into the vase by lifting it i use a vase because then you imagine your cat knocking off and breaking it because cats do that well, so by the same token, if you have extra energy about, it is possible to have nuclear reactions to make stuff heavier than iron. When does that happen? There's a few places where that happen, um, and they're actually pretty awesome. Um, one of the classic ones is supernova. So a supernova is a star blowing itself completely away as it dies. And there's two different kinds of supernova. One is a gigantic, huge, monguous thermonuclear bomb, one and a half times the mass of the sun exploding all at once. 
we call that a thermonuclear supernova. The other is when you have a really, really massive star and its core collapses and leaves behind either a neutron star or a black hole. We call this a core collapse supernova. In both cases, you release a huge amount of energy. And so all of that extra energy that gets released together with all of the various um, nuclei sitting around, sometimes the energy gets used to make heavier stuff. So that's where a lot of, um, in fact, that's where most of the iron that's in your blood comes from stuff like that. But that's where a lot of the heavy elements come. It turns out there's this other thing. So a neutron star is something that's about one to two times the mass of the sun, but it's only about 10 kilometers across. So if you think about packing the mass of the sun into something the size of like New York City, not state, really small. That's really, 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 really freaking dense. In fact, it's about as dense as an atomic nucleus. So one way of describing a neutron star is an atomic nucleus, the mass of the sun, that's big. Well, sometimes they collide. Um, we've always suspected this. And then a few years ago, we saw the gravitational wave signature of two neutron stars colliding. So we actually have observed this happen. Sometimes two neutron stars collide. And when they do this collision, a huge amount of energy is released. And elements are produced there too. And I think a lot, if not most of the gold in the universe was actually produced in neutron star collisions. So if you're wearing any gold, realize that the gold nucleus, so the gold atoms, the nucleus of the gold atoms was made in neutron star collisions. You are wearing neutron star collisions. I used to have neutron star collisions in my mouth. The point of all that was iron 56 is in a sense the most stable nucleus because it costs energy to make bigger, bigger stuff. But if there is energy about, you can make bigger stuff. And then they're stable, just like a vase sitting on the top of a shelf is stable. It won't spontaneously fall off. You actually have to push it to knock it off. So even though there are lower energy states, it won't spontaneously just go to the lower energy state. Um, and that's very much like activation energy in chemistry, if you've heard about that. It takes some doing to get it to actually fall apart. And that's why gold doesn't spontaneously fall apart to make iron plus other stuff, even though you could get energy out by doing that. But then some things are unstable, like uranium-235 will spontaneously fall apart. So the nuclear binding energy curve can tell you a lot about nuclear physics. Oh, yes, here's just a summary. So... Um, to get energy out, so again, you can go backwards if you put energy into stuff, right? So you get energy out by knocking a vase off the shelf and it falls to the ground. And the energy goes into kinetic energy just before it hits the ground and then it gets more complicated. If I start with small things and I build bigger things, I can get energy out by doing nuclear fusion, combining them together. But once I get up to iron, that doesn't work anymore. It costs energy to make bigger stuff. If I start with big things and break them apart, I can get energy out. That's fission, things falling apart. All right, so I want to define one more quantity in this class, and that's going to be this thing I call the efficiency of an energy generation process. Now, it's worth saying that what I am calling efficiency here is not what people are talking about when they talk about energy efficiency, you know, with, with sustainable energy and all that kind of stuff. It's a very different thing. This is a fundamental physics point of view. There, energy efficiency means when you generate energy, what fraction of it do you use for useful stuff, you know, versus heating stuff up? So a, a car that gets more miles per gallon is more energy efficient because it is converting more of its chemical energy and its gas tank into motion of the car, um, as opposed to just waste heat and other stuff like that. That's energy efficiency in everyday talk. I'm talking about a fundamental physics energy efficiency, and it is defined by this equation here. The amount of energy produced, and what do I mean, is basically everything other than mass, divided by the mass energy of the fuel that went into it. So here's an example, back to this methane burning. If I start with CH4, methane, and two oxygen molecules, and I burn the methane, so what is burning? Combining with oxygen and a chemical reaction. The result is a carbon dioxide molecule and two water molecules, and the energy get, I get out is about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. So what I could do is figure out what's the efficiency of this process. The energy produced is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. So I put that on the top. Then I want to divide by mass of the fuel C squared. Now here, you will sometimes just call the methane fuel in everyday speak because the ox, like your gas tank, just has gas in it and that's your fuel. But for this, you have to include the oxygen in the reaction that goes into the fuel. So it's everything that goes into the reaction. 
So the total mass of one methane and two oxygens is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. So if I multiply that by C squared and then I divide the energy that comes out of it, I get about 1.3 times 10 to the minus 10. So the energy efficiency of this reaction is 10 to the minus 10, which sounds really terrible, but um, it's not as terrible as it sounds because chemical reactions is how you live and it's how we do most of the things that we do in our everyday life. Actually, that's not entirely true because our everyday life depends a lot on solar energy, which ultimately comes from nuclear reactions, right? So all the plants, photosynthesis, right? They're using light from the sun. Where did that light come from? Nuclear reactions. So you actually use nuclear reactions every day in your life. Deal with it. But when you eat and you convert energy from your food into fastballs, you are doing chemical reactions. So, and when you drive your car, you are doing chemical reactions on the gas in your car things like that. And in fact, at least in this country, almost all, ah, I don't even know where it all comes from anymore, but a lot of the energy you use comes from burning coal or burning natural gas, chemical reactions. Now, more and more energy is coming from things like solar plants and wind farms, which converts kinetic energy of wind into usable electric energy. Um, and there are some countries like France that get a substantial amount of their power from nuclear power. We don't get a whole lot in this country. We get some. Um, but so even though this sounds really inefficient, remember, this is not energy efficiency like miles per gallon. This is just if I'm going to convert mass into energy, what fraction of mass can I convert to energy? Chemical reactions, one part in a billion, which is why in chemistry you can talk about the conservation of mass. Well, let's think about this process. You start with a positron and an electron, and they're moving very slowly, so there's basically no kinetic energy. And you produce two gamma ray photons afterwards, which has zero mass. And we'll call this gamma ray photons energy, right? So you could use these gamma rays to heat up the sun, which then makes the sun hot, which then makes it shine light. So it's an energy generation process. What is the efficiency of this? So we'll do this usual thing. Think about it. Try and conv con uh, convince yourself that one of these answers is right. And... Okay, I hope you paused and thought about it. Let's look at this. So 10 to the minus 10 is what you get for chemical reactions. You may remember when we talked about nuclear reactions, um, it looked like about 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2. You might have guessed one of those, but let's think about it. The total mass on the left is uh, 2 times 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, right? The total mass on the right is 0. So the mass energy on the left was 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. The energy on the right, mass plus other stuff, has to be exactly the same, but there's no mass, so it's all other stuff. All of the mass got converted to energy. And if you think about it, the energy produced, so on the right, because there's no mass energy, all of it is energy produced. All of it is stuff that was converted from mass to other forms, is 1.6, is that. And you divide that by the mass energy, the mc squared of the stuff on the left, the ratio is 1. So if your efficiency is 1, that is a 100% efficiency, you've converted all of your mass to energy. And if your goal is to take mass, which is stuff you can carry around, right? You can carry mass around. Carrying antimatter around requires really special handling because it tends to run into the walls of its container, which is matter, and annihilate. So you need magnetic bottles and stuff like that. You can do it, but it's tricky. And we don't use this as an energy generation process because the practically it's just not practical. Uh, but it does happen in particle accelerators and physical physics experiments. If you can carry the mass around and your goal is just to use up this mass by producing energy, and then the other the products that come out of the reactions you have to throw away. So that's like when you burn gas in your car, you throw away the results, and that causes global warming, and we all die over the course of the next century. So whatever the side effects, but you know. Um, if you, your goal is to produce energy, you start with the mass. However much mass was converted to energy here, all of it was converted to energy. That's an efficiency of one. That's the best you can ever do. You can't convert more mass energy than you have into energy. So the absolute best efficiency you can ever get is matter-antimatter annihilation, and that's an efficiency of one. Well, so now let's look at another thing. Let's go back to this nuclear reaction. Four protons go to an alpha particle. So remember, an alpha particle is a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons, plus this other stuff. And I tell you here, the mass of the proton is about um, 
938 MeV per C squared. On the right, you still have a whole lot of stuff in mass energy because the helium has mass energy and the two electrons have mass energy. But then there's also energy, and I say plus energy, and that includes gamma rays, so photons, as well as kinetic energy of the stuff that comes out. The total energy produced is about 24 MeV. What is the efficiency of this process? This you'll need a calculator for. So pause, use a calculator to see if you can figure this out. Okay, well, here's the thing you have to be careful about, is that the mass going into it is not 938 MeV per C squared. It's four times that, because there's four protons. So if I take 938.27 and I multiply it by four, I get 3,753. So 3,753 is the MeV, is the MC squared of the four protons. So that is, in the efficiency equation, remember it is energy generated by mass of reactants. If I take the energy generated, 24.7 MeV, and I divide it by four times the mc squared of a proton, I get 0 0.007, right? 0 0.007, which if you look at it, actually none of these answers is really good because 0 0.007 is closer to 0 0.01 than 0 0.001. So 10 to the minus 2 would have been a better answer, but 10 to the minus 3 clearly is the closest of all the ones that are here because it's 7 times 10 to the minus 3. So nuclear reactions typically have a energy generation efficiency of something a little less than 1%. So remember, chemical reactions, 10 to the minus 8%. Nuclear reactions, 0.1 to 1%. And this is why nuclear power can produce a whole lot more power per amount of fuel you have to put into it than chemical power can. And so that's why nuclear bombs are so much more efficient at blowing the crap out of things than chemical bombs are. But that's also why nuclear power plants can produce energy. I mean, of course, there's all the engineering considerations of it's harder to sustain nuclear reactions. And in fact, nuclear fusion reactions, we haven't even figured out how to sustain them. It's just making them continue going, the engineering costs end up not making it efficient yet. I hope we can get to it. But with nuclear fission, we can do it. And we do do it all the time. We have aircraft carriers that are powered by nuclear fission. They sail around and do things. And we have nuclear plants and that produces some of the energy we use. So we do that all the time. Nuclear reactions have a greater energy generation per mass of fuel potential by a lot than chemical reactions. Well, here's one more. I want to think, here's another interesting way you can generate energy, and that's by dropping rocks on something, which sounds weird, but it's a way to generate energy. And you can do things like make the dinosaurs go extinct with energy like this. Let's imagine an asteroid starts a long way away from the Earth. And it falls towards the Earth under Earth's gravity. When I say a long way away, that just means that initially the gravitational potential energy was zero because the gravitational potential energy, you see the equation down here, is G times the mass of the Earth um, times the mass of the asteroid divided by the distance they are between them. All right. So initially that distance is huge, so the energy is zero. So the initial energy is zero. That's what it means to say they're really far away and they're not moving. And then it falls towards the Earth and eventually will hit the surface of the Earth. So the gravitational potential energy of an asteroid at the surface of the Earth, that's what this G, M, E, mass of the Earth, times M, mass of the asteroid, divided by R, E, the radius of the Earth, because that's how far the surface of the Earth is from the center of the Earth. And notice that's a negative number. So there's got to be energy that is produced to make the things balance to zero. So the amount of energy produced is G, M, E, M over R. So here's a way to generate energy. Drop rocks into a well. Throw rocks into a well. You can generate energy doing that. Actually really harnessing that energy, kind of challenging, but it, you could do it. And there are people who've actually thought about, mostly science fiction writers, um, but, you know, theoretical physicists sort of worked out how you do this, generating energy by maintaining a little black hole and dropping stuff to the core of it. Practically speaking... At the cores of galaxies, there are gigantic black holes, and as matter falls into it, that matter heats up. Where did the energy come from? The stuff falling towards the black hole. Huge jets of particles and extremely bright x-rays come out of these things. That energy was generated by dropping stuff close to a black hole. So gravitational potential energy actually is a way to generate energy. Combine stuff, make stuff come closer together. You can get energy out doing that. Before the 20th century, um, and, you know, a couple decades into the 20th century, when we knew about nuclear fusion, that's what we as a society thought the sun generated its energy by contracting, that the sun was continually contracting. And as it did so, 
energy was released and that's what made the sun shine. Now, by the 20th century, we realized this couldn't be right. It was still our dominant model because we didn't have a better idea. We just didn't know. We realized it couldn't be right because the amount of energy you could get out by contracting the sun would only let the sun burn for, I don't remember what the number is, but hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of years. And at that point, geology, um, biological evolution, we knew that the earth had to have been around longer than that. So that couldn't have been the right way for the sun to, to generate energy. And eventually we figured out it was nuclear fusion and then stuff worked again. If you actually put the numbers in here, dropping an asteroid onto the earth, the energy generation efficiency is similar to, a little bit better than, but similar to the energy ge uh, generation efficiency of a chemical bomb. So you think, oh, that's not so bad. We blow up chemical bombs all the time. That's what a grenade is. Well, all right, I want you to imagine a chemical bomb that is in a rock the size of Connecticut. A bomb the size of Connecticut. That is a big chemical bomb. You may have heard of the Moab, the mother of all bombs, this huge chemical bomb that, that we have that you don't want to play with because it'll explode and you'll die. This is a really, 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 the equivalent of a really, 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 really big chemical bomb. That's enough energy to, you know, send the earth into a nuclear winter and kill all the dinosaurs. And that's how it happened. But, you know, see, the efficiency is pitily compared to nuclear reactions. So here, here are various, and again, this fundamental physics um, efficiency I'm talking about is how much energy do you convert from mass to other forms? That's the energy produced. And you divide by the mass of stuff that you started with. That's the efficiency. Chemical reactions, about 10 to the minus 10. Nuclear fusion, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2, depending on what you're fusing, is about how much energy you can get out. Matter, antimatter annihilation, perfect efficiency because you convert all of the mass to energy. And then dropping stuff. Well, dropping mass on Earth, it's about 10 to the minus 9. We worked that out. If you drop mass on Jupiter, which has happened back when I was in graduate school in the 90s, um, a comet slammed into Jupiter, and we got to watch it happen. It was pretty cool. Jupiter had bruises all over it that I could see with a little 8-inch telescope, like the ones we use in lab. You could see the little dark spots on Jupiter from where the comet hit it. 10 to the minus 8. So more efficient than blowing up a chemical bomb the size of the comet. Right? Jupiter got blasted. If you could drop stuff into the sun, the energy generation efficiency is 10 to the minus 6. And this is relevant because that is the energy generation efficiency um, of the sun contracting model for the sun generating energy. So if the sun was contracting, meaning it all gets closer together, the efficiency was about 10 to the minus 6, which means take the mass of the sun, one millionth of it is about how much energy you could get out. And you can use that to figure out how long the sun could shine. In contrast to nuclear fusion, where the energy generation efficiency is more like 1%, the sun can shine 10,000 times longer using nuclear fusion just to, if you generate energy at the same rate, because the rate at which you're uh, converting mass to energy is so much higher with fusion. And uh, other than matter-antimatter annihilation, the best way to generate energy is to drop mass near a black hole. And so that's what happens at the center of galaxies where there's supermassive black holes. Huge amounts of energy come out as mass falls near to the black hole. One little afterward. I'm not going to make you do anything with this on the exam. But it turns out in special relativity, so the, we've been using these equations like one half mv squared for kinetic energy. And it turns out also mv for momentum. But I won't go there. And they're not exactly right. Really, it turns out the energy of a particle is gamma times mc squared, where gamma is defined as this factor over here. It's 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. That's what gamma is. It's just a, a standard to call that gamma in physics. So the total energy, that's mass plus kinetic energy of a particle, is gamma times mc squared. So then its kinetic energy is its total energy minus its mass energy. So the baseball, right? The total kinetic energy was 150 joules. The total energy was a whole lot more than that. So the kinetic energy is just this little difference. So the kinetic energy is gamma minus 1 times mc squared, and that is not 1 half mv squared. But it turns out, if the speed of the particle is a lot less than the speed of light, which is the case with a fastball, 100 miles per hour is nothing compared to the speed of light, that, so notice 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared can also be written as 1 minus v squared over c squared to the minus 1 half, because square root is to the 1 half power, and then it's in the denominator, so it's a minus. 
It turns out there in, uh, it's a mathematical approximation that 1 minus v squared over c squared to the minus 1 half is approximately the same as 1 plus 1 half v squared over c squared. So I could then turn gamma minus 1 into 1 plus 1 half v squared over c squared minus 1. It becomes 1 half v squared over c squared. Multiply that by mc squared. The c squareds cancel. I end up with 1 half mv squared. And so that's why we use this equation for kinetic energy, because it is approximately right when the speed is a lot less than the speed of light. All right, so that's it. Um, I will post exam three over this coming weekend. Exam three, it will be due on Thursday. So next week is finals week, but we're not having a final in this class. I'm just giving you exam three during finals week. It will be due on Thursday, and then I'll grade it as soon as I can after that. It'll take a while. I'm so behind on grading. Um, I will on Friday, um, post a set of problems related to this e equals mc squared stuff. And then please reach out to me on the Discord or send, send me email or post questions on the website if you have any questions as you're studying for exam three. Exam three is going to cover magnetic induction um, as well as all the atoms and photons stuff we talked about and then the stuff I talked about today. All right. Uh, good luck in exam three and have a good summer. I will post a video, the old school video, video 35, for you to watch before Friday when you'll get these problem set. Now the problem set Friday won't ever be due because it's the last day of classes. I will post them and I will post the solutions. You can use them as review problems on this stuff. Bye.